Welcome to the Calder Farmstead. Now the ice hockey back out to center in transition. Carlson with Quinville two on one. Right wing cross across the Quinville scores. Here's a chance for Perry. Five feet scores on the face off. Up it's Eminger. Go back to Wierenski. Has it. Shoots one. Bounces off a man. Five seconds left. Wierenski. Another jam on the shot. Turning it. Firing. And now, with nine minutes gone in overtime, the Bears breaking out, right side with Bear, looks like cutting to the net, Bear, let's go! Let's go! Let's go! And here are your hosts, CeCe and Sean. Hello and greetings from the Mile High City of Denver, Colorado. And Blind River, Ontario. All right, Blind River. Welcome to the Calder Farmstead Podcast, episode number 16 for Tuesday, March 2nd. 2021. If you were hoping for a podcast featuring scathing indictments on the usage of DDT, we are not going to be much help. This is an American Hockey League podcast, and my name is CC Hockley. And I'm Sean O'Brien. And as always, we thank all you listeners for tuning in with us and viewers and viewers. And if you're new to hearing CC and I talk about hockey, we're going to recap some of the matchups from the previous weekend for you. We both watch a lot of AHL games and are going to talk about what we see when we watch film, as well as use some advanced stats. Uh, if that's new to you, you may want to head over to our podcast feed or YouTube channel, wherever you're listening to us from, and check out episode zero. It's a short primer on some of the stats we're going to be talking about, as well as how, how we view what's important on the ice. So if you're new to some of the more advanced hockey stats terms like point shares model or newer hockey terms like controlled zone entries, go check it out so that you better be able to pick up what we're putting down. I promise it isn't that nerdy or technical. It's only 20 minutes. And let's be honest, you wasted 20 minutes today Googling what is nomad land. So why not spend a little more time with us talking hockey? Sean, get out of my browser history. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, hey, before we get started on the weekend recap, uh, there is a, a note of interest that came out today. The first monthly awards for the AHL and, and definitely some guys that are well-deserving uh, Rem Pitlick player of the month, eight games played eight goals, two assists for 10 points. Jamie Drysdale, the San Diego goals, rookie of the month, 11 games played four goals, five assists for nine points total. And the goaltender of the month, Logan Thompson of the Henderson silver Knights, five games played four, one and zero record, 1.81 goals against average and a 0. 0.942 save percentage. Sean, your thoughts on those three getting those nods for the monthly awards. I mean, for awards like this, it's really hard to make a choice where I'm like, Jesus, that guy, that guy, how did you make like, <laughs> no, like were they three deserving candidates for the award? Absolutely. I'm mm -hmm. surprised to see Trevor Zegris not get it. Just, I, I feel like, both him and Drysdale have been really good and we're splitting hairs, but I guess like he he's probably been the prospect that has generated the most tangible excitement uh, outside of his market than any other I can remember in a long time. I mean, but I, I get it. Like he left a couple games. He played only seven or eight games. He was great in them, but like Drysdale played. Yeah. So no, I mean, it's, it's hard to pick, you know, pick nits at at those kind of awards like they're sure. th those are three very good candidates like good yeah. to them yeah i agree i think the only one that i would maybe throw in a different name would be jeremy swayman of providence because he's right. four he's he's undefeated he's four oh and oh and granted yeah his goals against average is a little higher and his save percentage is a little lower but you know I, I don't know. I think it just with the, the buzz around Jeremy Swayman coming in and everything like that, I, I would say, you know, for goaltender of the month, if you're undefeated, I mean, and you've got four games played. I mean, you look at the, the list and uh, you know, you've got Swayman with four games played and there's a number of other guys as well, but their records don't necessarily match up. And then you've got Logan Thompson, who's got five games played in the top 20 goaltenders here. And yeah, I don't know. I mean, just throwing, just kind of playing devil's advocate a little bit, maybe throwing another name in the hat. Yeah, and I mean, you could have really just thrown anyone on Chicago in there. Seth Jarvis would have been a good one too. Right. Um, I, honestly, uh, I thought uh, was it John Sebastian Day? I thought he was a good choice. Mm -hmm. But I mean, yeah, like I said, they did fine. Like they they picked good guys. It's yes. 
yeah, we like you said, it's nitpicking, and and that's exactly what I did. So sorry to <laughs> drag that segment on a little longer than maybe should have been. But no, anyway, right. yeah, we've got a lot of we got a lot of stuff to carry to to cover rather. So let's carry on and let's begin with the Canadian division. We started. Well, we we did, uh, predicted rather the Laval Rocket and the Manitoba Moose from last week, and let's unpack those predi- oh, predictions. Oh, look, we both predicted a Laval sweep, and look what happened: Laval swept. They yep. they they figured out who Manitoba was. They adjusted their game, and they got two wins out of it. Man, or Laval um, in that first game. You know, they're both one goal affairs, but that first game four to three victory, and the second game a two to one victory. And, and Sean, you did say something. You added a qualifier to your sweep prediction. You said only if Caden Primu starts a game, and he did. He started that first one, and Lindgren got the nod for the second game, but Primu did start the first game. Yeah, and <laughs> he looked okay. Uh-huh. I mean, Primo Primo really kind of did the thing that I feel like I, I harped on him for the preseason, where like the goals he let in, two of the three were just like, I mean. It's not great. They weren't bad goals, but they were not. They were goals I felt like he should have stopped. They were ones where I gave him a lot of grief in the preseason for just, you know, he tends to have like these small mental lapses on what feel like low percentage shots that just somehow squeak through. And yeah, low percentage shots of, you know, over the course of a season will sneak in, but it just seems like more of the ones against him sneak in, not by a lot. But, like, the two that he let up in the Laval game, like, especially when you see the context of that game and how dominant Laval was in that game, the goals that he let up are just, like, part of me thinks he was bored. Like, Laval dominated play. Like, the, the ice tilted very much in their favor, and he hadn't seen a shot for a while. It was like, oh, 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 oops. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense. I mean, yeah. with, with how dominant, like you said, the Rocket has been lately. I yeah, mean, I mean. Th- this was... <laughs> These were both one goal games, but my God, did they not play like one goal games? I mean, uh, Burden and uh, his tandem partner, whose name is temporarily eluding me, Mm -hmm. uh, they both played absolutely outstanding. I mean, Burden, I felt like, made big saves, but the goals that got scored against him weren't, you know, oh, well, he had no chance at that kind of goals. They were very much more in the middle danger kind of range is how I would describe them. But like he made big saves and bailed them out time and time again. Uh, in the second game, I'm thinking of Arthur Silo Silos. He played very well. Mm-hmm. I mean, given up two goals on a lot of very high danger chances, his team did not do him any favors in front. They gave him a lot of chances from that inner slot area. He was, he was magnificent for him, but it wasn't enough. Now, okay, we, you mentioned Burden. Let's let's pivot from you know talking about Caden Primu and, and and what he did. Now, in the preview, we did talk about Burden standing on his head for the Moose and the top six doing all the heavy lifting, while the bottom six just were getting crushed. You know, we talked about that top heavy roster and just how the top six forwards were just doing the heavy lifting. Like I mentioned, how did that hold this weekend? Yeah, that's what happened. Hmm. <laughs> that is a hundred percent what happened. Uh, Manitoba had seven shots from the home plate area on Friday and two on Saturday. Yeah. That's not enough period. That's the whole game. Mm. Uh, on Friday, two of those shots were from, uh, from the home plate area on Friday of the seven were from lines that were not Gravax or Perfetti's, uh, on Saturday, uh, one of them was. That's it. Wow. Well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, those those lines, uh, especially with Reichel, who uh, didn't play the whole time, it, it, it was it was not pretty. Uh, Manitoba really did not get anything going, and it, it, it was Laval that f- forced that onto them. It, it wasn't like sure. in other cases where this was just one team beat itself. No, Laval controlled the pace of the game. Manitoba's forecheck was often nowhere to be seen. Whereas Laval's was relentlessly up in the grill of the Moose puck carrier in all three zones. If the Moose got it out of the defensive zone on a controlled exit, they often didn't get much further as 
Rocket defensemen were standing them up in the neutral zone. Uh, a lot of times uh, you saw Xavier Ouellette, uh as well as many of the other defensemen on the Rocket, just as soon as they see a puck coming across the, the center ice line, they're jumping right in, skating forward and attacking, breaking up that chance before it happens. That's good neutral zone defense. Rarely did you see Manitoba cross into the Laval zone with possession five on five. On the power play, which didn't happen often for either team, and we talked about that a little bit in the preview of like, this is a low penalized series. Uh, they, they had more success on the power play, but that was more execution than it was what you normally see five on five. Uh, but Laval absolutely controlled the pace and tempo of this entire uh, weekend and looked just dominant in what should have been games that were much further apart. That in mind, who in particular was getting it done for the rocket with them clicking on all cylinders, like you said they were? I mean, I have to give it to uh, Blandisi and Harvey Pinard. They were just everywhere. They mostly stayed on the same line, but occasionally, you know, played elsewhere, but they put on a possession clinic in the moose zone, Jordan wheel <laughs> along with them. I mean, when they were on the ice, the pace and flow of the game went through them. Uh, they generated chances. Uh, and one of those, th uh, one of those three felt like they had a hand in every rocket goal that got scored on Friday and were just a big part of the, the offense on Saturday, even like it, it was it, they were very much the straw that stirred the drink uh, offensively for the Rockets. Great work down low. Uh, great work behind the goal line, finding passing lanes, uh, finding soft ice in the in the home plate area. Just absolutely doing their jobs. And, you know, <laughs> I know that we, we kind of didn't really pump the tires of Manitoba very much, but... Uh, you know, what What are some positives for the Moose? Surely something good had to come out of this weekend. There were some. Uh, I will say I thought Burden has developed well from my notes from last season. He missed tracking the puck in a few spots, had a moment of tour chaos that he struggled with, but he looked less like he relied on his athleticism and more on good technical structure for save selections. He had a lot more poise, and it, it was something to see uh, him make a step forward. I don't think he's going to be pushing for playing time in Winnipeg just yet, especially because Connor Hellybuck is, well, Connor Hellybuck. <laughs> I, I think, Connor though, Hellybuck. that he yeah. definitely has a future as an NHL, or if, if, big if, this level of progress can continue. Like, he still has work to do, he still has progress to be made, but I'm very encouraged seeing him from where I remember and where my notes have him last season to where I've seen him in this weekend series. Now, yes, small samples and all of that, but like there were market improvements and that's something to look forward to coming forward for the Moose. I also thought their discipline was outstanding. They took three penalties all weekend, three. Wow. And they continued to look good on the PK when they got sent there. Like they, they did not give up a lot of power play chances. And that's something that not a lot of other teams can say. And good teams can you know, kill uh, penalties. Chicago has struggled with it all season and it's bitten them a couple times. It didn't on the game that they lost, but they almost let Grand Rapids back into that game because they scored three power play goals. Mm -hmm. The fact that they're not taking, that they have a, such a good penalty differential and they're able to kill the ones they do take, that that's makes transitioning to just fixing some things five on five a lot easier. I also want to say, uh, Jeff Mallett had a pretty good game for the role the Moose asked of him. He's never going to be a highlight reel scorer or a playmaker who just dazzles you or deeks guys, but he was easily their best four checker, the best four checker in white all weekend. And creating scoring chances and driving play are more valuable than four checking guys uh, who can win battles along the boards and put pressure on defensemen during dump ins. But like those guys have value too. And they're often a good pairing with someone who's who doesn't have those skills like perfetti's not a bad four checker he's i'd say above average at it but like if you have someone like mallet playing that aggressive f1 role you take pressure off of asking cole perfetti to do everything and you also give him more space to be that second wave of pressure who's able to step up and pick off passes that mallet's pressure force now that's not what happened for the most part in this although don't get me wrong. Perfetti picked off a beautiful pass that he just scored like a, you know, picks off the pass right in the slot, puts it right in. But Mallet's 
was easily their best four checker and I think will be a bright spot going forward because good four checking ability isn't something that waxes and wanes really. And I think it's very telling. Uh, you mentioned Manitoba's special teams prowess, especially on the penalty kill, uh, rather, um, penalty kill prowess. So Manitoba has played eight games. They have 48 penalty minutes. Stockton has played four games, and they have 58 penalty minutes. <laughs> so so that goes to show just how, you know, just how well they are doing um, in that Canadian division there. And it's funny because, you know, we picked Laval and then we had the three teams in the middle that were going to kind of, you know, battle it out for two, three, and four. Uh, we picked Toronto, Stockton, and Belleville. Well, at this point, you know, you've got Toronto, Manitoba, and Stockton. And then Belleville's at the bottom. They've only won one game this season. But again, it's an early season. And only Stockton and Belleville have only played four games up to this point. The other three teams, oddly enough, that are in the, the top three rankings are, have played eight games. So... Yeah, and I think there's some of some of that going in. I also want to say uh, Manitoba's power play when it got opportunities mm -hmm. didn't look bad. Like okay. they they didn't put you know the puck in the net as often as you would like, or in the opportunities. But like they had chances. They set up and used the one three one well, whereas other teams <laughs> do not. Ooh, a little foreshadowing there. Yeah. Well, hey, let's put a bow on the Canadian division. That'll be it. Uh, that's uh, like we said, Laval swept Manitoba and that's our first division. We will go to the North division. We'll talk about Hershey and Binghamton. And of course, we, we got we to gotta pay the bills. So wait for the advertisements to roll. Uh, listen to our sponsors and we shall return very, very shortly. All right, and we are back from our ad break, and we are going to talk about the North Division, or at least the, the series that we predicted in the North Division. Uh, we've covered the Canadian Division and Laval and Manitoba, and now we are going to talk about the Bears and the Devils, Hershey and Binghamton. So I chose Binghamton to win on Friday, Hershey to win on Saturday. Sean said Hershey was going to sweep with Samsonov starting and then uh, Fukale versus not Sen. So Jill Sen. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, it was, uh, uh, and see, and I've got my little note sheet here. So Hershey, six to three. The, the first victory, Hershey, six to three. And then shut out. Hershey shut out Binghamton, three to zero that second game. So it was Sen versus Samson off that first game. Fukale versus Cormier, that second game. So yeah. And, uh, Sean, you got it right. I mean, there was only one series you got wrong this week, and we'll get to that. But, uh, yeah, you got this one right, and uh, I gave Binghamton maybe a little too much credit on this one. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. Uh, <laughs> they're coming along. Uh, but 1,000-foot view of the weekend series here. On yeah. Friday, the Devils looked like a better team in the first period to me. It may not have shown up on the score sheet, but having watched the game, uh, I would have said... It was close, but I thought the Devils looked like the slightly better team. You know, 51-49 kind of better team. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was it. <laughs> that was the only period that I would say the Devils were the better team. Hershey murdered them in the second period. And while Binghamton showed signs of life in the third, I mean, at that point, it was really too little too late. I mean, on Saturday, it felt uh, they felt more competitive in periods one and three. But again, Hershey just mauled both second periods and they were the better team for five of the six periods they played and absolutely dominated both second periods on Friday and Saturday. Okay. Well, hey, I mean, <laughs> let's just, let's go ahead and dive in head first. I mean, how, I mean, you talked about Hershey, five of six periods, how decisive, I mean, it's kind of maybe a moot question at this point, but break it down. How decisive of a, of a sweep was it for Hershey? So they won 6-3 on Friday and 3-0 three, three on Saturday, like you said. But my God, did they give up some great A's, uh, that timely goaltending. Mostly Samsonov, Samsonov uh, bailed them out of. Spencer Carberry is certainly going to have some video clips to show his team, uh, as quite a few times I thought the Bears defended the inner slot very poorly uh, mm. and left some big chances that should not have happened with better defense or more active sticks or just better awareness. Um, Will Graber was noticeably bad all weekend, and he's someone who I understand is transitioning from being a forward to playing defense and is still kind of trying to feel that rollout. 
but I think that feeling out should probably happen in South Carolina and not Hershey uh, because he very much was one of the sore spots for Hershey and what was an otherwise pretty well played series overall. Okay. Now I know a late edit to the preview that we were left talking about was uh, Axel Giannis Fialbi. That was a mouthful. Axel Giannis Fialbi on the cutting room floor. Did he stay cold? Or whatever funk Axel Janssen Fallaby was in prior to Friday, uh, he shook that off. He looked <laughs> fantastic and dangerous on almost every shift throughout the weekend. I mean, his one goal, one assist, two point weekend does not tell the tale of how good he really was and how he easily could have had a three or four goal weekend should he have gotten a little more puck luck and gotten McMichael to use some deception on a two on one on Saturday. Like McMichael just stared down that pass. Gotcha. Now, regarding the Bears, any any closing thoughts for the weekend on Hershey? Yeah, uh, I harped a lot on the power play, and they yeah, went one did. for four on the weekend. <laughs> and the one that went in was whatever. It was a weird tip by Molson in front off a shot from the side. But it was kind of hard to see exactly what happened. I didn't have a good camera angle on it. But I'm going to continue to be alarmed at how poor the power play looks. They still are just like yeah we'll shoot it from outside make almost no effort to work pucks in the inside and take a lot of shots and just hope for tips and traffic and rebounds which is a very ineffective strategy and will continue to be and the bears power play will continue to be clicking at a rate that is just middling to bottom half of the league when they have a more talent than what's going on there but Mm -hmm. I will say uh, another thing to wrap things up here. Uh, Garrett Pilon woke up Friday morning and he chose violence and did the same thing on Saturday, (laughs) a between the legs highlight reel goal. And if you didn't see it, uh, go search this goal out. It was dirty. I, I I was watching the game live and I just went, Oh, (laughs) it takes a little bit for your jaw to drop, but yeah, like it was, it was nasty. And I mean, then on Saturday, pair of apples, he was absolutely locked in, feeling it all weekend. Well, there you have it. Yeah, Hershey wrapped up. Let's talk Binghamton. Uh, maybe unfortunately, now the <laughs> someone had to stand out positively, right? Yeah, I mean, it's hard for you to have a weekend series and not have at least one positive note. Sure. And the, Binghamton had a couple, so don't think out there, Devils fans, that I hate your team. Uh, Jesper <laughs> Boquist's I uh, was easily the best player for the Devils, I thought. I don't think it was terribly close either. I mean, his assist on Stu Nietzsche's goal was nasty. And he was around the puck making plays all weekend. That behind-the-back pass to Stu Nietzsche, like, he was not about to just, you know, be one-upped by Garrett Pilon and take it lying down. <laughs> like, And o- overall, he was the only player who I felt like I noticed every time he got on the ice. I could not say the same about Brent Senny, who I feel like still just doesn't look ready for the season. It looks like he still has concrete in his gloves and his skates. Like he's Mm. not moving well when he has the puck. He's not handling it well. He has poor control and just like it. I don't want to say he's unmotivated just going through the motions because that's not fair to him. But he definitely does not look like the same guy who was, you know, someone who's put up good point totals and good goal scoring in his career in the NHL. He, he does not look like that guy. He does not look like someone New Jersey should be interested in calling up. And that's alarming to me. Like I'm not willing to call him, you know, lost for the season yet. Let's, let's not do that. I'm not Stephen A. Smith, but like <laughs> if I'm the coaching staff and fans, I am alarmed at what I see on film from him. Okay. So you mentioned a couple of uh, Binghamton standout players. What about Nolan Foote? In the moments in which Nolan Foote wasn't scoring, he was barely noticeable. And we talked about this in the preview. The Devils have to find ways to get the puck on his stick more because he's the most talented forward they have, especially when he has the puck on his stick. But like (laughs) he does not get involved in the offense. And I don't think it's for lack of trying necessarily. It's that, he's not always surrounded with the best talent on um, his line when he was with um, Ben street that seemed to work well, but he didn't play a lot with street this weekend. And 
he needs to get those puck touches early. Like he needs to hop off the bench and within the first 10 seconds, get the puck on his stick. And if you're thinking, well, you can't manufacture those kind of touches, you know, you can actually like if you structure a breakout, you can absolutely make sure that he's the guy who's carrying the puck on your breakout, or he's that first look from your defenseman on breakout passes that he's the strong side winger for. You absolutely can manufacture those touches and they should, because when he is touching the puck, he looks more dynamic, but he just doesn't get it enough. Hmm. And that's bad for both him as a player, him, the devils as a team and his development going forward. You can't improve in game play if you're not getting your stick on the puck. Right. And, and speaking of the team as, as a whole, I mean, I did fail to mention earlier that the devils are now on a six game losing streak. You know, I mentioned in the preview for the weekend that they won their first two games and have dropped their last four. Well, now they've dropped their last six. So, you know, on the six game skid, I was bullish at least for a one, one victory <laughs> this weekend, but didn't even happen. So on a team level, did the devil show you any sense of improvement and transition, which I'm just going to, I'm just going to assume sunk the ship again this weekend. <laughs> You are correct that the devil's transition game is in shambles and it is in mm. shambles for a lot of reasons, mm. but their defenseman botching retrievals and making first passes is a big part of it. Like when they get the puck dumped in their defensemen are not picking up and retrieving that puck well under pressure. And when they are, they're making bad first passes. Like the transition game starts in those two incredibly critical moments and they're screwing it up. Mm. They either fail to get it under pressure, make bad choices with it, or just see ghosts on the forecheck. Like they feel pressure when none is there. They don't turn around and make the decision because they feel like there's a forechecker right on them. And there isn't. They're seeing ghosts. Quenneville, White, and Vukovic were all very guilty of doing all of those uh, over the course of the weekend. And while the transition was bad Friday, it was almost at least passable on Saturday. Despite one very bad sequence in the second period where the Bears scored two goals. But Outside, of, yeah, I know it's outside of the moment in which it looked really terrible. It looked okay. Like there were flashes of competence, even in a few fleeting moments of looking good. And in those moments when they managed to get transition going, get Boquist up the ice, get foot up the ice with the puck, they look good. There is a competent team in here. If they can actually break the puck out and with control from their defensive zone, they're not this bad. And I question whether or not they will get to achieve that, but they at least seem like they're trending in the right direction in terms of their transition game. Because make no mistake, that is what's standing between the Devils and winning games right now, is their ability to retrieve pucks off dump-ins and start the breakout going the other way. You know, and I know um, we're, we didn't really cover them this weekend, but... It, it, just everything, maybe not everything you said, but a lot of points that you made about the Binghamton Devils kind of remind me about the Ontario Reign, because you know Ontario has a lot of, they have a lot of promise, they have a lot of uh, potential, but you know a after ten games played, you know they've got this one eight and one record, and and they're dwelling in the bottom of the of the Pacific Division, which is not something that you and I, with all the young guns that they have and the black and silver bandits, well they're not stealing games. Because they just, they can't put together a 60 minute effort. And so, you know, maybe the reasons are different, but the fact is you've got two underperforming teams in both the North division and the, the Pacific division. And so they just can't put it together in transition. Now, I mean, Ontario, I've noticed in transition can, you know, have their moments of brilliance. I mean, like you said, I mean, they, they their passing is, you know, tape to tape it is, is great and they can connect and, and you know, pass it across the Royal road so that they can get those goals scored. But, but yeah, I, I don't see that in Ontario and, and, and maybe, yeah, Binghamton's kind of cut from the same ilk. It's just, they can't keep it consistent and put it together on a consistent basis. And I, I at least feel for Ontario a little more. Okay. Uh, because you have a new coach, a lot of new players, a lot mm -hmm. of new faces, a weird year where training camp was basically just make it up as you go along. But like the Devils, same coaches last year, a lot of familiar faces there. If That's not true. within the team, then within the organization, this should not look this bad based on, you know, how other teams have handled it in similar circumstances, at least. I, I, I don't know. But for, if I'm, 
a Devils fan, I have much less patience than I do if I'm Ontario. Like Ontario fans, I have to feel like saw this coming. But right. we're not here to break those down. We <laughs> are here to uh, talk about the series we previewed, which coming up next is our Midwestern swing through uh, with Elaine Shercliffe. So we will bring Elaine on. But first, you know, shipping me to these exotic locales costs money and we have to pay those bills. And we do so with ads. So please hang with us through some ads to, you know, send me to someplace fun next time. And uh, we will come back and talk Griffin's Wolves. So exotic. All right. And we are back from covering the North Division, the Hershey Bears and the Binghamton Devils series. And we're going to segue right on to the Central Division. And of course, we had Elaine Shercliffe, the AHL Central Division correspondent for Full Press Hockey. And uh, we had her on on Friday to, to make picks and predictions for a couple of the Central Division series that we were covering. And so it's only fair to bring her back on for the weekend recap. Once again, Elaine Shercliffe, welcome Hi. back. Hi, Hello. guys. <laughs> it's nice Howdy. to be right about my picks, right? Like... I know. Tell me at about least it. one of them. I was surprised. <laughs> I was really nervous about that one with Chicago. Well, well, and and the thing was, this is the only pick that Sean got wrong for all the picks that we had. <laughs> this is the only one he got wrong. So it's very impressive. Just one out of a whole shit ton. So and I even I mean, said, like when we were making picks, I'm like, Elaine makes good points. I could totally see this happening, but I just refuse to pick against Chicago until, until like, I, said, saw I will be the last person to pick against Chicago at this point. Yeah. So I now picking against Chicago is on the table, but yeah, that, I mean, let's talk about that game first and foremost, because it was wild. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, first and foremost, I mean, for those who don't know, Grand Rapids and Chicago, they had a couple games this weekend. And Grand Rapids actually beat the undefeated Chicago Wolves, handing them their, their first loss of the season in a 4-1 to game. So, yeah, that's setting the table for you guys. I mean, yeah, have at it. I mean, why was this game so crazy? I mean, well, first of all, they, they did exactly what I said they should do to win, which was they came in fast. They had a 1-0 lead. For most of the first period, I think maybe the whole first period. I can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they refused to stop hitting. The Griffins refused. They just kept hitting hard, hitting fast. They were agitating them. I mean, this is where Tanner Janot was really missed. Is he was not able to help um, maintain that emotional control. And he wasn't able to help build up the plays when the the star guys were getting descended upon um it was they the griffins looked the pretty much the best they looked all season in that game because they played three full periods absolutely and i mean that barber uh hiroshi chris colo line the, i mean that line was just amazing the whole weekend mm -hmm. it blossomed it this uh, weekend, it just blossomed into this beautiful flower <laughs> that I was not expecting. Um, and I talked about Riley Barber at the beginning of the season with someone and said that, like, this is his year to break out. I just feel it like this is one of his last chances, I felt like, because he has been on a few different teams. And he's living his best life. It is like he is thriving and vibing in Grand Rapids. <laughs> And he and I asked him about it after the game, and he he said it, it basically comes down to the fact that everyone from Grand Rapids to Detroit, it's like family. They're all get along, and they're all on the same page. So, and I mean, too, I think I don't know if I said this directly in the, our preseason preview of Grand Rapids, but I remember thinking that like Chris Cole. I remember saying Chris Cola would be benefited from being a center on a line with two guys that are more offensive minded because he's much more of a defensive minded guy. He yes. can make plays in tight and down low, but he's much better off kind of covering for guys who like to cheat out of the zone. I think I mentioned Svechnikov specifically, but Barber is definitely a guy who's just like, oh, I can start exiting the zone. Now. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gone. And I think that that having someone like Chris Colo on his line who's able to more cover for the fact that he's going to fly the zone every chance he gets really pairs is a good pairing for them. 
even if I didn't name them by name, by concept, that was kind of what I was going for. And I think that's it. You're right. It absolutely blossoms. Like Barber looked great this weekend. Tara Hirose, who has been hit and miss up and down for most of his career, as are a lot of Red Wings picks. Uh, he certainly looked his sharpest all season. Uh, but I mean, what it looked like too. Chicago, even though Grand Rapids was up going into the third, like they managed to keep Chicago back yes. the whole time. Like it never felt like it was them clinging desperately to a lead. Like they no. took that fight to Chicago the whole time, even when they were ahead. Like there wasn't a let's sit on this lead kind of mentality. Yeah. In both in both games in general, like <clears throat> the the Griffins were like, that's cool. So we're just going to play some hockey and you're going to enjoy it or not because we're going to score on you. <laughs> I feel like that was the mentality. And then you have guys like Giovanni Smith. He's just like this big dude who honestly should not be in Grand Rapids and he should not be sitting on a taxi squad. He should be playing in the NHL. Um, he's just so good. And he's got the big body to help with screens and that is what hurt Chicago this weekend. They allowed their goalies to be screened nonstop by the Griffins. And the Griffins are good at that. You covered mm -hmm. that when they played when they played Cleveland, that the Grand Rapids likes to get those guys down low so that they screen the goaltender. Yeah. And so yeah. I think they knew that Chicago was going to prepare for that because the next game, they were launching shots from the point. And they were clearing scoring lanes from like from the blue line and from the top of the face off circle. Like they were mixing it up. And I think that's what makes the Griffins always a deadly team just in general every every season because they change it up. You think that you know what the Griffins are going to do. And as a team to be successful against them, you have to think Murphy's Law. Anything that can happen will happen when you play the Griffins. I will say too, uh, Antoine Bebo has a long history of being inconsistent. Yes. And they definitely seem to find him on a bad Bebo night. A bad yes. Bebo night. <laughs> a bad Bebo beat, a triple B, as it were. <laughs> yes. And I mean, because he's a very athletic goalie, he likes to get out on the top of his crease and use his athleticism to kind of, you know, commit to a shooter. And if he's wrong, he can make those big explosive moves to get back to his post and cover the the net. But when you put traffic in front of him, that kind of limits him. And I mean, this is true of a lot of the goaltenders who are super athletic that kind of rely on their athleticism mm -hmm. is they don't like being surrounded by bodies in front because it limits the area in which they're able to get out, challenge the shot, and then turn back uh, and use that athletic explosiveness to get back because they aren't able to come out as far. And right. That's definitely something, like you said, they put traffic in front of them and goaltenders who have that style do not like traffic. Right. And it seems like people, when they play the Griffins, are like, let's put our goalie in that likes to wander. And it's like, no, no, don't, don't, no. Oh, okay. Oh, You're oh, definitely oh. going to get lit up tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I kind of wanted to to pivot a little bit here because um, first off, I did want to mention again that Elaine and I's predictions were correct that Chicago would be dealt their first loss of the season. And so <laughs> I just, you know, since Sean is rarely wrong, <laughs> I I did, rarely, but I mean, this week it, it was a rarity. I mean, this was the only one you got wrong out of, you know, uh, a good six or seven predictions. So, but no, I did, I did want to kind of contrast a little bit on special teams here. So that first game, both teams, uh, Chicago was 0 for 5 on the power play. Grand Rapids 0 for 4. Here's right. the kicker. You, you transferred to that 8 to 4 game on that on Sunday that Chicago ended up winning. Grand Rapids was 3 of 4 on the power play and Chicago right? was 2 for 4. So, Elaine, uh, what what was the what was the <laughs> difference maker there? I mean, uh, well, the difference the difference maker was all the penalties. Oh, ah, okay. Well, <laughs> there, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of fighting. Uh, there was a lot of really aggressive hitting. Um, the slashes were legit slashes. The hookings were hooks. Like, there was no way around them. It was not like, oh, he accidentally. It was like, yeah, no, that happened. And most of the that. guys, right, and most of the guys knew it. They were just like, yeah, I did it. <laughs> like, this is happening. Um, and, like, 
you know, Dominic Shine fought Joey Keen, and you know Shine. He's always trying to fight a younger guy thinking, or like a younger, smaller guy thinking he's going to get the one up. And sometimes he does with his little like one-two punch and you're literally knocked out. And Joey Keen apparently is a fighter because he was just hammering him and he was getting ready to unload like spring like spring shots. And the refs were like, no, no, we got to stop this. But <clears throat> they were constantly down or up a man. And so at that point, I think as a coach, you go into – focusing heavily on how you're playing with your special teams because if they're going to be out there a lot then that's what you got to do plus phil tomasino is back and he you know he's really good on the special teams so i'll also say too that in the the first game uh jameson reese was not nearly as big a factor like grand rapids did a good job of kind of boxing him out and uh i think he took that personally in the second game as yes he was- <laughs> And I took that person. He did not go without notice in uh, in the the rematch on Sunday. He no, had and it was and just yeah, it was his birthday on Friday, and I think that's why he took it so personally. He tried so hard to score a birthday goal. He tried to set up goals on his birthday. Nothing happened, and so yeah, I think he totally took it personally and, <laughs> and was like, "Well, I guess the day after, two days later, is fine." <laughs> yeah. And and Tomasino got that goal. I mean, it was at even strength. He was it was only forty eight seconds into the game, but but that goal on Sunday. I mean, forty eight seconds and boom, you start off the game like that. I think I think whenever you get that going, when you, you have a goal in the first minute of the game, uh, it, it, it's it's one thing to score the first goal in the game. It's another thing to score a goal in the first minute of the game. I think it really sets the tone. Right. I mean it. it yeah, whether it's the Chicago Wolves or the San Jose Barracuda, if you score that first goal in the game, I mean, you've got some momentum. You've got something to build on. So, right. Yeah. And Chicago definitely, we saw, struggled with not scoring the first goal of the game. Because this was what, like, one of the first games, I think, maybe. It, it They have not had many times when they didn't score first, and it definitely affected the way they played. They didn't know how to, I think they only know how to play when they have the momentum offhand and they have to work for it. But also when Grand Rapids gets that momentum, they they don't know how to stop. And that's just something that the Detroit Red Wings do as well. But. And I mean, even, it, it doesn't even have to necessarily be the start of a game, but like the start of a period. You look again mm-hmm. at uh, the first sure. game on Friday at 44 seconds in Dominic Shine two you know, a minute and a half later, Riley Barber on that, you know, dominant line through the weekend. Uh, there, that, that's bang, bang. You're down three, nothing already. And it's set 18 minutes left, 17, 58 left in the second period. Like that's, that's a, a real big momentum shift where it's like, all right, we're carrying a one, nothing lead. We come out and we just light it up right away. I mean, that turns the tide of a game right there. Yeah, it really does. Well, speaking of turning the tide, uh, let's move to the second series that we predicted. And uh, our predictions didn't go really as planned because when when you have a prediction for a series, it's you you know usually two or three games. Well, only one game got played. You know, Cleveland, you know, playing Rockford on Saturday, coming out with the victory six to three. We'll get to that because holy smokes, the circumstances <laughs> surrounding that were quite precarious, and yet they overcame them with flying covers colors. It was rather odd, but um, that game on Saturday, Cleveland wins six to three over Rockford. And then we have a game that's postponed. So uh, yeah, I mean, Elaine was saying both games are going to go to overtime one in the shootout. It was going to be a split. Um, I was saying Cleveland wins on Saturday, Rockford on Sunday, obviously the Sunday game didn't happen. And Sean was saying it was really just a, a depending on on which goaltender was going to be a net. And and Sean, you really didn't pick any goaltenders that that actually played a net on Saturday. Well, was, we didn't know that all these people were getting sent down. Yeah, it that's was true. like it was like the Blackhawks <laughs> and the Jackets were like, okay, well, we're not playing, so maybe we should help out our farm team since they're playing each other, and we're just going to send everyone down. And I was like. <laughs> okay, so like I don't even know what's gonna happen this weekend now because that yeah. happened. <laughs> Kiv Lenix and uh and Colin Delia ended up in debt. And it's like yeah, yeah. Uh, Kiv Lenix, Col- I think I at least had some idea could get the nod. I mm-hmm. didn't see Colin Delia coming, but you know. No. 
Yeah, I was yeah, actually Colin disappointed. Didn't see most of those shots coming. So right. Ooh. Okay. So I let's talk. Let's talk. Let's okay. talk. Elaine, you have the floor. My dear. <laughs> I said that they need to ride Kale Morris more. And then they send down Colin Delia, and I'm sure um, they might not have had the choice to play him or not, because if you want your – the NHL team wants their goaltender to get reps in before they even try to think about playing them. Obviously, that's first come, first serve. But I was having heart attacks watching him play. He roved way too much. Cody Franzen was all over the place acting like another goaltender. Because he would just leave leave it open. He would just leave it open. And there was one play where he was behind the net. And the Monsters took it. And they are so lucky that they got in front of that net in time. Because there was no other Rockford players around to stop, stop it from happening other than Cody Franzen. Who was ultimately the one who saved a goal from happening. I saw I, that play. That was in your article, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was in, it was insane. And I was like, what goes, I would understand if you were like a veteran who typically does really well with that, or you were a new guy who you're trying to figure out if that's your wheelhouse. But Colin Delia, you know how the monsters are. <laughs> you know that they're a bunch of sharp shooters who when they get the chance, Especially a guy, well, especially this season with Carson Meyer and Connor McDonald. And then Tyler Secura, like you played with him. You know what he's going to do, right? <laughs> like, and he um, scored on him. <laughs> and he did. And it was very, it was very similar to times when he had scored on the Monsters just by sitting at the crease and picking up a rebound, jumping over a puck to knock it in. And so I was very confused as to what the Ice Hogs were doing. And I chalked it up to the fact that I don't think that they had much of a choice in the situation. Um, but that guy was roving. Which I, I'm surprised by. Like, I understand when, you know, a team sends a prospect down to to get work in and you're like, I want my guy to start. But like... Colin Delia is that guy for you, Chicago? Like you traded for Malcolm Subban and you're sending this dude down for Malcolm Subban. And that's like, oh yeah, he's our 26 year old undrafted uh, prospect who is a below league save percentage over 20 starts in the NHL. Okay. There's, <laughs> there's a chance. So this is something um, I've learned over the years with goaltenders and being sent up and down, even if they're not playing is there's a chance that something wasn't quite working in practice, um, that they were still kind of making these mistakes. And honestly, the best way to learn from those mistakes is to do them in a game and have that um, essentially PTSD haunt you for the rest of your life <laughs> over what you did. So there's a chance that that happened. But also the other thing is you just can't let your goaltenders in a season like this, you just can't let them sit because they already haven't been playing. And it protects your investment in the long run because if Colin Dealey is sitting for over 365 days, you know, where he's only has a little bit of starts here and there and doesn't play much, what, what are you going to get out of him? There's no growth or development in him. He's going to hit his ceiling. Like his ceiling will lower from not playing. Like there are some people who are true backups and I do not think Colin Dealey is a true backup. I would also say too, like, because of the way that, that it's structured this year, like you're going to have some, some, like taxi squad wise, you have to have a goalie there. Somebody's going to sit. And I mean, I'm surprised at the rotation they've used from Subban and Delia, just because I really don't think either of them are terribly better than the other, but like, has Matt Tompkins done anything to merit, you know, press box time? Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. Stand like, on that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, you're good. <laughs> Explain <when> yourself. <laughs> he he hasn't been finishing. He will start to stop, but he hasn't been completely stopping. Like with Carson Myers' second goal on uh, Monday night, like last Monday, he didn't clamp down hard enough on his like his like in between his arm and his body. And so that puck rolled out and it just trickled into the net. 
that's an example. He he'll go down on the puck, but then he'll kind of lift his hand up a little and that allows the extra pokes. He's not fundamentally sound this season. And that could be because he hasn't played much. Uh, but this season, he he definitely deserves to be sitting. And like I said, in a shortened season, in a pandemic, and even in the AHL in general, just alternate your goalies. You know, unless you're, especially when you're not playing for the Calder Cup, just alternate your goalies. Allegedly not playing for the Calder Cup. <laughs> no official like, announcement. But. Okay. There hasn't been an official <laughs> announcement. And I, yeah, it's really unlikely that happens. And to clarify, I meant, has Matt Topkins done anything to be sitting in Chicago and not Rockford? Like, for oh. me, I think <laughs> I he just, yeah, that's why I was saying, like, why is Matt Tom, like, I would have thought they would have rotated Delia and Subban pretty, you know, as much as they could because mm -hmm. neither are terribly good. And Kevin Lankinen out of nowhere apparently is I'm nearly positive. That's voodoo, but whatever. <laughs> it's Kevin Lankinen season. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it is. I guess that's, so. how Cor that's how Corey Crawford was though. When he first was getting started, you know, he wasn't super great. And then it was like, bam, Stanley cup. Jordan Bennington, same thing. When a goalie get <laughs> <laughs> right, when a goal, well, I yeah, and then sometimes it tapers <laughs> off, sometimes it tapers away. <laughs> and you punch uh, some San Jose Sharks in the mouth off your way getting pulled off the ice. But well, but hey, that's a whole other. <laughs> it, it is now. Now let me pivot real quick. We're gonna wrap this thing up real quick, Elaine. What were the circumstances? I kind of alluded to it earlier on, but holy cow, Cleveland kind of pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. And really won this game when they, in all, in all seriousness, they shouldn't have because the odds yeah. were most definitely against them. Explain a little what the circumstances were for Cleveland going into this one. So they started the game with six defensemen and ten forwards. And when mm -hmm. I was watching warmups, I was like, it looks a little small, but I I wasn't really counting like I normally do. I was just kind of trying to get ready, and then their lines were kind of moving around in warmups. And I'm like, okay, so they're just trying to figure out their lines. And then Tony Brown tweets out the lines and it's like fourth line, Brett Gallant. And I'm like, is there no more to that? Like, did he forget to tweet the rest? And then I look down, I look at the scratches and I'm like, oh, that's, that's it. Okay. That's a cool thing. Like, <laughs> and it's not the first time that they've rolled with a short bench at the end of last season, their last two games of the season, they played with, um, 10 and five. And I think it was like 11 and 11 and seven, something like that. And someone was, one of the defenders was playing both forward and defense. Utility guy. Yeah. Wild. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then, so they're in the game and the first period had, and I put this in my article, it had some real vibes of like, what did it cost you? Everything. Because <laughs> <laughs> Nick Lappin scores a goal. The next play, he tries to score another goal, trips over trips over the goaltender, flies into the boards. We don't see him the rest of the game. So now it's nine and six. And then Brett Gallant scores a goal. And then all of a sudden, about a minute later, we see Dylan Simpson head down the tunnel. We don't see him the rest of the game. They, they played the second and third period. Nine, Nine and, and five. five. And I was like, can Brad Teeson play forward? <laughs> what is, <laughs> does he know how to play that position too? And I don't know how they did it because there was a few times when I thought they were going to get tired and they didn't. And they dominated the Ice Hogs. Like the Ice Hogs shot themselves in the foot. You know, they were passing to the to the monsters. And I was like, what, what is happening? They literally are have like no one like you you could be dominating this game right now and they they didn't the the monsters just dominated them and um zach jordan kind of put it up to once you get in the zone once you get there there's no stopping you so that's basically what they did and i, I don't <laughs> even know how to describe what what they did because it was just i don't want to say magical but like it was kind of magical because you're like it's there's nine and five guys. They haven't played that well all season. And now is when they play their best hockey of the season <laughs> because they had to. Their backs were up against the wall. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that's true. And they look so good. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Well, and real quick, we were going to – oh, Sean, you were going to say something. Go ahead, bud. No, I was just going to say, definitely no uh, post-game bicycle rides for that uh, for those guys. No. Well, I'm sure some did because some of them definitely need to, to like, cool down and leave. Like, when I was le- – I left really late, um, and I, I saw someone leaving when I was leaving. So oh, wow. it, someone was probably really needed that, like, cool down time. I don't know how long they're supposed to stay in there either, so um, – I mean, there have been times when they've had really long games and short games, and I've seen them in seasons past, like leaving at 1 a.m. and they have a game at like one or two the next day. Some of these monsters, they just have to do their post-game rituals or else it just throws them off. That's hockey. Yeah. <laughs> and Elaine, we were gonna we were gonna actually cover uh, the Texas Iowa series, yes. but we weren't exactly sure that that was gonna happen because they canceled you know, Wednesday's games. So Sean and I are like, well, we'll scrap it. And of course they, they split their, their series uh, for the weekend as well. So, so Elaine, unfortunately will not be joining us next week. Um, So, but we will be covering Texas and Iowa and hopefully we can get your, your thoughts on that. Because uh, like I said, Elaine has been covering the total, the, you know, the totality all six teams of the central division. So, so we'll definitely get to pick Elaine's brain um, come the week in the weeks to come, but just not this next coming week because, yeah. well, we've, I, I mean, and this will give us an opportunity to get some other faces on. I've got some other guests that, that might be lined up as well. So we'll give yeah. Elaine the week off and, yay. and, uh, yay. Hey, but <laughs> Elaine, we, we definitely appreciate you coming on, you know, breaking down the Chicago Grand Rapids series, breaking down, you know, the Cleveland and Rockford Ice Hogs one game that they played, <laughs> which was, and it was basically two games. It felt like because so much happened. Sure, sure, so. for sure. But <laughs> but hey, we're gonna we're gonna let you go and, and get on with the rest of your evening. But again, Elaine Shercliffe, AHL Central Division correspondent for full, full press hockey. Check out her work at fullpresshockey.com and check out her tweets at I'm a rain dancer. I am a R A I N dancer <laughs> on Twitter. So Elaine, thanks again for coming on. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Have a good night. Peace. Bye. Bye-bye. All righty. And with that, we are going to transition to the North Division and have Alexandra Ackerman back on for that. Uh, but first, a word from our sponsors. All right. And we are back from advertisements and our messages to pay the bills, as it were, from our sponsors. So once again, we thank Elaine for helping us cover the Central Division and now we invite back on to cover the predictions that the three of us made on Friday. Well, at least it dropped on Friday morning. And once again, from the sinbin.net, covering the Syracuse Crunch for them, is Alexandra Ackerman. So welcome back, Alex. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me back. Of course, of course. Thanks for making time out for uh, for us to record our weekend recap show. And uh, of course, with the North Division and the picks that we made, uh, we, we had to have you back on, you know, it was just kind of, we have to resolve this. We had to resolve the two games that were played and, uh, yeah, our picks were, uh, at least you and I, Alex, our picks were a little off. Um, Utica, the game on Saturday that Syracuse played, that was a four, two loss, uh, for the Syracuse crunch, but, uh, Monday's game, the, the night that we're recording this, uh, Alex is fresh off Well, Alex and Sean are fresh off of both. Uh, watching that game and and the recap of that game, I unfortunately was stuck in Denver traffic during that, so not advisable to watch a game when you're stuck in tra- stuck in traffic. So I did not. So yeah, I'm <laughs> I'm surprised that the AHL TV reception out here in uh, Blind River, Ontario, was this good. Uh, credit to them. <laughs> yeah, they're still on dial-up, aren't they? 56k connection. I you know I didn't ask when I connected to the Wi-Fi out here. I just kind of took whatever was given to me. Hey, he, he can't, you know, beggars can't be choosers in Blind River, Ontario, Canada. So Absolutely. anyway, so that's setting the table. <laughs> Syracuse did take the victory against Rochester on Monday night, four to three. So that's setting the table. And now, uh, yeah, Sean, yeah, you picked it correctly. Yeah, we, we uh, yeah, you specifically said Utica will overpower uh, Syracuse and uh, Syracuse will triumph over rochester yeah 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 you're right we were wrong i did Love say it. that they could they would sneak one out against rochester uh i don't know i would say utica overpowered them 
but I did get at least the latter half of that part wrong. Right. So <laughs> yes, he did. Yes, he did. So, uh, all right. Well, um, yeah, let's, let's talk first and foremost. I mean, uh, Montembeau and net, uh, Alex, what I'll, I'll kind of kick it over to you. What did you think of Montembeau and net on Saturday night when the crunch took on the Utica Comets? I've seen better performances uh, both from him and from goalies in general. Mm, Saturday night, it was not his night. You know, he, Sean and I were talking before we went on air. He did the first two goals he gave up were goals that should not have been given up. You can't blame the defense on them. You can't blame anyone else but yourself. And I think that, you know, they always talk about those are ones goalies would want back. I think those first two goals of that game Saturday night were goals that he would want back. Yeah, both both Vincent Arsenal goals. I mean, the one where he's just flying down the, the wing, Arsenal shooting the whole way. And it, it was an awkward looking goal, too. Like, I almost wanted to say it looked like he was anticipating a pass, but there was nobody. Like, it was just Arsenal alone, you know, one on one coming wide. He just rips it right past him. Monty's got to stop that. The, the other uh, Arsenal goal, um, you know, he just missed, like, he kind of played the puck into an empty space that. He wasn't looking at, and Arsenal right there just tucks in a freebie. Like, that was an early St. Patrick's Day gift. There's green in your jersey, so here, here is your March presence, uh, a free goal, Vincent Arsenal. Like, th- those are two that – I mean, especially in a game that ended up being 4-2 with a, an empty netter. Like, that's – those are goals that change the outcome, especially the first one. Two minutes into the game, you know, mm-hmm. nothing's really settled yet, and boom, you're down one nothing off of – that's those are two that Montembeau can't can't let in for not alone just being bad goal reasons, but for momentum reasons and clearly affecting the outcome of the game. He stops one of those. We're looking at a completely different game. Yeah. And, you know, momentum has been a big thing for the crunch this season. And I'm not sure if it's just because they're so young, if because they don't have the experience on the bench to like calm everybody down, push everybody through, we'll get it back. It'll be okay. And actually Monday's game against Rochester was the first game where the team was really able to do that, which was ironic because the team's captain didn't play in Monday's game. And normally that's the first guy you look to, to calm the team down. So it, it, the momentum thing really seems to be big for Syracuse this season. And once they lose it, it's gone. You know, that third period that the crunch played, they had four shots on goal. Like you're behind by one goal and you have four shots on goal in the entire period. Like that can't happen. You have to be pouring it on that. You have to keep pushing, but they just couldn't get that momentum back. Yeah, and that was that, that was kind of my thoughts, too, is uh, looking at that third period. I mean, down 3-2, four shots on goal in the third. I mean, if you're if you're the head coach uh, of Syracuse at that moment, like, you have to go into the locker room and break stuff or yell or do – like, because that's just – I mean, I, I'm, I'm not an experienced coach, but uh, I would say in my one season of assistant coaching, that would be a moment in which I'm f- losing my mind uh, of – we're down by one, and that's the effort you give me. Yeah, I like to call it blunt Ben, just because I like alliteration, and you know it. it and and Coach Ben Grew can get really, really just. You can hear it in his voice when he's just fed up and done, and he gets very blunt and very uh, not mean. But just very like, this is how it is. And this is the truth of the situation. And we've seen a lot of Blunt Ben, especially after the last two games. He has been very critical of the overall effort on the team. He has been very clear that there are certain players who are taking this to their advantage and doing what they need to do. And then there are other players that are just kind of, I believe he phrased it, waiting for a train to come. (laughs) kind of invoking the image of just someone hanging out on a platform, just waiting for, you know, the puck to land at their feet and magically go into the net. And, uh, you know, he, he was much happier after Monday's effort than Saturday's. That is for sure. That is definitely true. Uh, first, uh, good look that, uh, I got at, uh, Jack Quinn from Rochester. Uh, I thought he looked all right. His skating is a lot more concerning to me than I think I previously evaluated, but it's been a while. 
Uh, what were your thoughts seeing Jack Quinn uh, technically live and in person? <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> I don't, I spent a good half of Monday's game on the phone with New York State contact tracing. <laughs> Um, so to be honest with you, I missed a good chunk of what happened uh, in uh, Monday's game. So I'm not sure that I am equipped to answer that question. That's fair. And if the, if that's the reasoning for that seems incredibly reasonable. So uh, I'm going to yeah. absolutely let you give me a pass on that one. <laughs> uh, Cece, any, uh, any thoughts to contribute here? Uh, I mean, like I said earlier, not for Monday's game because I was stuck in. <laughs> I was either at at my day job or stuck in Denver traffic, and and I got home, you know, took a breather, you know, got to chat with the girlfriend a little bit, and then boom, we jumped right in here. So, but I mean, talking about Saturday's game, I mean, taking a look at that, um, something that really stuck out to me was that I mean, Utica went one for five on the power play, which is you know that's a solid twenty percent, but Syracuse went zero for six, and you know. Special teams, it's like it's, it's kind of glaring to me when when a you, you get four, five, six power plays and you are just fruitless on it. And so I was kind of curious on what your guys' take was with the crunch, you know, against Utica, now the the top team in the North Division, and and Syracuse, you know, continues to just kind of eh, underwhelm, and especially you know on the power play. What were your guys' thoughts on that Saturday power play? I'm sure the excuse is going to be that, well, the top talent is still up with the Lightning. Mm. But as we all know in this league, eventually that's not an excuse anymore. Because if after three, four games of your top talent being up with the Lightning, they're no longer your top talent because they haven't been playing on the team. You know, as of right now, Barry Boulay, who was leading the team for a long time, is now third on the team in scoring because he's not on the roster. So other players have to step up and start working on those special teams and start getting things going. And, you know, honestly, if I was going to call out anybody, I honestly think I would be calling out Gabriel Fortier at this point in time. I am very surprised that he has not stepped up and really taken the reins and taken advantage of getting as much ice time as he's getting because he's one of our 20 year old guys. He's one of those guys that was supposed to be in Syracuse to start the season anyways. So it's not like he's a guy that's 18 fresh out of the WHL or the CHL, you know, he, people were looking to him to have a big season and he's been fairly invisible over the last couple of games. He had a great first game, scored two goals. It was looking really good. And then he's kind of become invisible. So I really think that the new top guys on the team have to start stepping up. They have to start shooting and they have to start getting themselves into position to score. Cause that's the other thing I'm seeing is that in games when the crunch have like high shots on goal totals, none of them are quality shots. They're just drilling them straight into the goaltender's chest and that's not going to do anything. Yeah. I think that's a good point too. Uh, I would say that the power play at least at times didn't like, it didn't look Hershey bad. It looked regular bad. Like 48, I think calling him out is a good point. Uh, there were definitely some moments where it seemed like he was in the right place, but not doing the right thing. And mm -hmm. I also think too, there's plenty of opportunity for them to shake up those units. Um, Nikita Pavlichev just came, uh, made his AHL debut tonight. I thought he looked pretty good. I know that he worked uh, on Penn State's power play uh, while he was there. And as it's, you know, a big forward who can move, I think he would be someone you could sneak in for some power play two time. I also mm -hmm. want to point out, since we're talking about special teams, their penalty kill did not do well this weekend. Uh, or weekend is Monday is technically not a weekend. Uh, most times uh, they were uh, two for six tonight, Monday and one for five uh, on Saturday. So they gave up three power play goals on 11 attempts. Now, the one that Cole Lynn scored uh, for Utica, I mean, tip from a point shot. I don't want to say that's fluky, but if those are the ways you're going to get beat, I suppose that's okay. But they gave up a lot of chances in those five power plays mm -hmm. to Utica. And mm -hmm. that's something that would concern me more than anything. It seemed like a, uh, 
a lot of times they're struggling to have their forwards maintain that gap in the middle. Uh, so structurally penalty kill, uh, most penalty kills use the exact same tactic. It's called the check press where basically you have like a three person triangle in front and then a Rover who chases the puck and that Rover changes depending on what side the puck is on. So, you know, one forward will take one half of the ice. If the puck goes below the dots, the defenseman becomes the Rover and so on. But that responsibility between those two forwards and those two D to cover that kind of middle lane is really huge. And attacking that kind of buffer is uh, how Rochester scored on what we call the Oshi play, uh, which we talked about when we previewed Hershey, but that uh, sideboards, guy puts it right down to the guy below the goal line who just one touches it to the guy in the middle, which was Ogilvy for Rochester and he scores. And that's manipulating kind of that inner box area that's between the forwards and defensemen and responsibilities. And that seemed to be a lot of the problems that I noticed from their penalty kill over the course of the weekend. Like they didn't always get exploited when they did it, but mm -hmm. there were definitely moments in which if I'm reviewing that film and I'm, you know, the assistant coach in charge of the penalty kill, that I'm saying we need to clean that up. I noticed a lot of standing around too. And, and I don't know, and it not necessarily on the penalty kill, although I'm sure it happened on the penalty kill as well, but it just seemed like guys weren't moving their feet. Well, especially Saturday night versus Rochester or versus Utica. And I don't know how much of like Florida's, method of play and Tampa Bay's method of play, from what I can tell from talking to different people around the league, aren't necessarily a great match. And so I'm not sure how much of this is coming from trying to meld those two together versus just, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I, I wonder if that might also be kind of at the cause of some of this is just that the two styles of play that these organizations are used to their prospects playing just aren't melding well together. Mm -hmm. I think there's that. I mean, I'm surprised that Florida is even trying to have inputs on like Syracuse this year. And I mean, some of that is just because it's like, all right, this is a weird year. We're sending you to a different place and us trying to get like a half C strategy thing going is probably not going to be a great way to develop our prospects anyway. So, and Florida seems to be one of the few teams that's not playing merry-go-round with their players as much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Florida also has a long history of not developing anyone and just signing, you know, bottom six free agents to fill out the bottom of their lineup. So like clearly these prospects to them aren't that important <laughs> historically looking at that franchise, but yeah, I can clearly see like that being a, a strain on, on Ben grew and surprisingly on a lot of the other coaches who have to manage, like I think it was Chicago that like they have to play a certain number of prospects from each organization each night, which is insane to try and keep track of. Like they have to have like nine from Nashville and seven from Carolina or some like weird. Oh. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know how you keep track of that. That, that looks like a flow chart from hell, but mm -hmm. I, I can definitely see where there is not a lot of overlap, especially because Tampa plays a very unique offensive style because they have the weapons to do it. When you have, you know, well, in theory, when you have Nikita Kucherov and, you know, Stamkos and uh, we just keep naming, you know, studs that are on Tampa, but like they play a very unique system where they play a lot more high forward in the offensive zone and kind of work that high cycle, which a lot of other teams don't, uh, especially Florida. Florida does not do that. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Trying to blend that in with whatever Florida's pulling on Ben Grew to, you know, utilize is got to be frustrating enough. Plus, if I remember right, Sy Syracuse also has a small village as a roster trying to, you know, hear all of the nagging. Like, when are you going to put me in, coach? Is it, am I, is it in me tonight? That's got to be. Yeah, I'd imagine that that's super challenging. And I mean, the roster is thinning out a little bit. The WHL teams recalled most of their players that are on Syracuse ro Syracuse's roster. I think there's one left from the WHL because his team is has not started to play yet. You know, we don't know a whole lot about what the CHL is planning yet. So, I mean, the roster is thinning, but I'm even just looking at it right now on the AHL.com. And I mean, there's 33 players listed on the Crunch's current roster right now. That's a big 
team. That's, <laughs> that's a lot of guys. That's three guys <laughs> short of two full rosters. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, I mean, yeah, it, it's just, it's crazy. And that doesn't, is that goalie Tyler Johnson even on this list? Like that, the, the third goalie that the crunch currently has in camp, whose name was, is ironically Tyler Johnson, isn't even on this list. So technically it's 34. Are you so, 100% sure it's not the Tyler Johnson that the Lightning have been trying to throw away for like a month and a half? We joked about that being their last ditch cap effort that they just decided to make Johnson into a goalie and shove him down into the American five Hockey foot League. Nine goalie, yeah. Oh god. Hey, Carl Gehring was five foot eight, so you know it's possible. It is. Yeah, it's absolutely. Possible. Well, I mean. But, Utica, Utica and Chicago are definitely on the, the beneficiary end of a dual affiliation um, as unique as both of their situations are to each other. You know, Chicago's first in the central Utica's first in the North. And unfortunately it just isn't gelling for Syracuse. I mean, you know, you, uh, we, we kind of predicted it's like, Oh, these three teams are going to do really well this year. Cause they've got the benefit of a dual affiliation. But I mean, like Sean showcased and, and, you know, highlighted pretty well and, you know, earlier on in our conversation, it's the fact that it's the fact that you, you have, you know, these different systems and, and 33 guys on the roster and everybody trying to, you know, fight for ice time and everything like that. And it's, yeah, it's not going to always be a a Chicago or Utica scenario. So Mm -hmm. yeah, Syracuse is still, you know, it's, it's still fairly, I want to say fairly early in the season. I mean, you know, quarter, quarter plus of the way through, and so, you know, they still have some time to work out the kinks and everything like that, even though this season is a bit of a sprint. And I mean, too, there there are some positive things that are showing through for sure. I think that there are some guys like Otto Sampi is not the same Otto Sampi that Crunch fans have been watching for, what, like three seasons now? He has now taken over the team lead in scoring, which had you told me two months ago before the season started that, you know, by March, Otto Sampi is going to be number one on the team in scoring. I would have suggested that you call your local contact tracing line because <laughs> you have I would not have. Yes, I would not have expected. You're delirious. You're, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, I mean, these guys that are stepping up and are taking advantage of the, the ice time that Coach Ben is giving them is fantastic. And it's really, really good to see. I just wish that we were seeing more of it. Well, Well, luckily for Syracuse, they have a good chance at like kind of a get right game uh, against Wilkes-Barre Scranton. As long as they can duck a Max Legacy start, I think that can be uh, a good kind of problem solving game for them because uh, Syracuse, or, Wilkes-Barre Scranton's other two options in that are Emil Larmy and Shane Starrett, who have been bad. Uh, so you know uh, I think, and I have not thought too much of them in the preseason or watching them a bit here and there, that they are uh, an upper echelon kind of team. So if, if mm-hmm. Syracuse can manage to duck a Max Legacy start, that could very well be kind of a get right game for them that I think would uh, play in their favor. It'll be interesting to see if Ben, um, Coach Grew, goes with the hot hand with Spencer Martin in goal for Syracuse, or if he goes back to, you know, kind of the more veteran guy in Montembeau, because Martin looked really good, I thought, especially in the closing minutes of the game against Rochester on Monday. He pulled off some really good saves while the crunch was on the PK in those couple of final minutes, and he was really scrambling and flailing around, but he got the job done. So my guess is he'll go back to Spencer Martin, but I have also been wrong in the past about what's in his head, especially when it comes to goalie rotation. So that'll be interesting to see on both ends, which goalie the teams will go with. I think if it were me, I would, and I saw that Lagasse was starting on the other end, I would put Martin in because I think he's the goalie that gives you the best chance to start. But if I get a lucky break and I get like Shane Starrett on the other end, I think that's a good game for Monty to, you know, snag a win. Uh, I would, mm-hmm. I would try and do it that way, but you know, it's like I said, I've stopped trying to predict roster moves and more of just kind of cover all the options as opposed to like, Oh yeah, the ducks are totally going to leave Trevor Zegers in the AHL. Nope. Didn't happen. <laughs> nope. Yeah. So 
Anyway, uh, CC, anything left? Because I am I am out of questions and good points to make here. Oh no, that it's a good time to wrap up. I think, and we'll uh, we'll just you know put a little bow on it and uh, see if Alex is available for a uh, you know a, a weekend preview and maybe a weekend recap uh, next week. So once again, Alexandra Ackerman from the Sinbin.net. You can find her at Sinbin Crunch on Twitter and follow along with all the hockey musings that she has. And you can also listen to her podcast, Syracuse Speaks, on the sinbin.net as well. So once again, Alex, thank you for coming on the show. And we really appreciate you taking time to talk hockey with us. You're very welcome. And thank you both very much. Enjoy the rest of your nights. Thank you. Thank you. You, you do the same. Thanks. Be safe. You're welcome. All right. Alex Ackerman from the sinbin.net once again. So. We've got a few, well, a number of divisions covered and one to go in the Pacific Division. But before we do that, we have to take another break for our sponsors. So stay tuned and we will be right back. All right. And we're back from uh, from our friends. We're, we're back from hosting a couple friends, I should say. And yeah, thank you for Alex Ackerman joining the show in regards to the North Division, specifically the Syracuse Crunch against the Utica Comets and Rochester Americans. And last but not least, my favorite, the Pacific Division. So here we go. First and foremost, we're going to talk about the, oh my goodness, we're going to talk about <laughs> the most audacious prediction that I think Sean made out of all six or seven that he did. He went against, he, <laughs> balling, balling, money, money, money. Here comes the money. Sean O'Brien is now Shane O'Mac. <laughs> here comes the money. But he didn't win anything. Henderson with a PDO of 108 going into the weekend. Sean said, let's ride that PDO train. They're going for the sweep. I said, no, nah, I think San Diego is going to get a game in there. Which game did I choose? Oh, I see. I forget. Now I got to look at Friday. Again. Yes, I put San Diego wins first, Henderson wins second. Of course you knew that off the top of your head. So, <laughs> Sean, with the audacious, bodacious, and just overall outlandish prediction that Henderson was going to sweep this weekend, and guess what? By God, they did it. By God. So, yeah, Henderson, a couple of closer games, 3-2 on Friday, 4-2 on, on Saturday, and yeah, uh, from... Gosh, from from what I've noticed, Henderson. I mean, when they when they score first and they can really get out of the gate, you know, it it really doesn't matter if if they respond or if the opposing team responds rather with with one goal or with two goals. I mean, you know, from what I noticed on Friday, Henderson scored first. San Diego answered again. Well, they answered in the first and they answered again in the second, and then Henderson goes off to rattle, you know, uh, two more goals and then add an empty netter at the end there, but. You know, they haven't missed a beat. They haven't missed a beat since Peyton Krebs went up to the, you know, went up to the WHL with the Winnipeg Ice. Yeah. And I mean, their, their games look not nearly as close to my estimation as maybe you would have thought for one goal games. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, don't get me wrong. It was still a, a back and forth kind of game on Friday. Uh, but, or sorry, it was a back and forth game on Saturday, mm -hmm. Friday, a little more low event kind of feeling out. Uh, but, uh, I will say we do have to talk about the debut of the new Russian overlord in Henderson, who the fans have already very much embraced Pavel Dorofeyev. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he had an absolutely electric goal that he scored was great on both games. I mean, he really has stood out. And that's, I mean, he's not someone we talked in, uh, talked about in the season preview, mostly because no. I had no idea he would make it to the AHL this season. I thought, nope, he's not going to be here. There's no sense in chatting about a player that doesn't need to be known. And, well, how many times have we said, I need to stop trying to predict what teams are going <laughs> to do with their players? Just, I will learn eventually. Yeah, but I mean, uh, yeah, it's it's hard to to have the crystal ball all the time, you know. Yeah. And the fact that you know he comes out on Saturday and puts in a one goal, one assist effort, and just completely, you know, you know, like you said, he just uh, 
<laughs> puts himself on the map. I mean, he was the, the first goal scored in that game. And, you know, granted, it was about 16 minutes into the first period. But but the fact that you make such a statement in your second AHL game played ever, you know, and he's just uh, I believe he's just a 20 year old kid. Let me look at this here. Yeah. October 2000. So, I mean, yeah, yeah he's not even old enough to drink in the United States yet. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for him, I mean, from, from watching him play a little bit, uh, the, the kid can shoot. He has a rocket shot. He's got very good offensive vision. His skating is okay. Mm-hmm. He's like, it, it, he needs to work on that if he wants to be more than just a, you know, injury replacement, uh, 13th forward kind of guy in the NHL. I mean, he has better offensive ability than that, but like skating counts for quite a lot. And I think he's someone who needs to make some strides in that. Like, it's not terrible. He's not a bad skater for the AHL level. Uh, but his his offensive vision, his ability with the puck, his, his shot, this is a kid that can shoot. Like, I know they're going to miss Peyton Krebs, but it looks like they're basically going to get Russian Peyton Krebs. Uh, oh, okay. And, you know, uh, real quick, Sean, I don't mean to interrupt. Did you have something else to say? Something more? No, go ahead. No. Um, but just a, a couple things I noticed as well is that, you know, in regards to, you know, the shots on goal, pretty close in both games. You know, that first game um, on the 26th, you had, San Diego 31 to 29 and then you had Henderson 38 to 33 but I think the difference for for Henderson is the fact that you, you got a guy like an Oscar Dansk you, you you bring you can bring Dansk in for those two games and he he did a solid effort you know in that in that first game he had 29 saves on 31 shots and the next game he had 31 saves on 33 shots so you know the fact that San Diego only scored two goals against Oscar Dansk in both games. And, you know, he just got called up by Vegas again, the Vegas Golden Knights. So, but, you know, to have a guy like Dansk that can dance back and forth between the NHL and the AHL at will, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> I think dance, that's a, Dansk. Dance, Dansk. Uh, playing in double four time. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, Fallout Boy. Uh, that was bad. Sorry. My... My uh, my apologies to Patrick Stump, but uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah, dance for him to be able to contribute at the AHL level, you know, and and still be able to be back and forth to the Vegas Golden Knights is, yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a nice valuable asset to have, and to add that with Thompson and Ferguson as well. Also, too, uh, Dylan Sakura looked amazing. Uh, scored mm-hmm. a beauty on uh, was it Friday night? They all bleed together. It really does. And we cover a lot of games, folks. So it's yeah, just... Friday power play goal. Absolute ripper. Like mm, mm-hmm. he's someone too. I, I like, I knew Sakura was good. I did not think he was this good. Like, well, but, there seems to be that magic in Vegas though. I mean, I remember when the golden Knights came out and we we're all like that roster is terrible. And there were a couple of bright spots. Like, uh, I, I think, well, I mean, nobody saw uh, Wild Bill coming, but um, mm-hmm. there were a lot of guys on that roster uh, initially for Vegas that it's like, well, they're not terrible. Uh, Jonathan Marsh or so, good. Riley Smith is good. And I feel like Henderson has very much fallen into that like category of maybe not the golden misfits, but the silver misfits. Like they have a lot of guys that, maybe not cast offs, but are, I mean, Thomas Yerko's played all over the place. He's been fantastic for them. Uh, maybe not putting the puck in the net necessarily, but he's been a good veteran leader for them. Sakura has been a little, has been kind of, you know, hit and miss with a couple of organizations. He's been great for them. Uh, it, it's, it's really been kind of a team effort every night too. And that's not something you would expect from, this roster that even though it was good in Chicago, the pieces of it, there, there were a lot of ways in which this could not have fit together. Well, you know, in this crazy year in a new location with a new coach and a, a, a different style of play, mm-hmm. it's easy to get distracted by, you know, how Vegas or Vegas adjacent is uh, too. And they, it seems like they haven't missed a beat at all. Well, and you mentioned Sakura. And, and him, you know, kind of bouncing around and everything like that. I know in our preview, we talked about him, you know, having 
leading the team with 20 shots on goal and, and him only having, you know, four points to show for it through, you know, seven games. Well, you know, fast forward through the weekend. Now he had a goal on Friday. He had a goal on Saturday. So now his totals nine games, four goals, two assists for six points total and 24 shots on goal. So two goals in four shots this weekend for Dylan Sakura. I mean, like you said, if, if that man going to shoot that puck on the, <laughs> if, it, if he's going to shoot the puck on the net, then get that man, the puck. And, you know, and obviously he's going to produce. So there you go. I think the big thing too, like I said in our preview is like, if you want to score for, you know, 30 goals a season, 40 goals in a season or score at that pace, nobody's making 30 this year. <laughs> but like, if you want to score at that pace, you need to shoot the puck a lot. Like, yeah. I mean, Look at the shot totals that Ovechkin puts up to get to the numbers that he does. Like he shoots the puck a lot. Same with everyone who, who everyone who hits 50, who hits 60, you know, in the AHL more realistically, who hits, you know, 30, 40, like those guys need to shoot. Like the best shooters in in hockey are, you know, 16%, 18% puck going in, you know, you need to shoot five, six, seven times to get those shots to, for the math to kind of work itself out. And Sakura is doing that. And that's mm-hmm. something that a lot of players who shoot really well, just don't ever do. They don't ever make those, those counting totals because they just don't shoot enough. And, and quite frankly, I know I talked about in the preview that this, this team was very spread out in regards to their point scoring and everything. Well, guess who's leading the team in goals now? Granted, it's only by one, but Dylan Sakura Dylan now Sakura. leads Henderson with four goals. So shooters got to shoot and Dylan Sakura, two goals on four shots over the weekend, hell of an effort. So there you have it. Henderson getting the sweep and remaining at the top of the Pacific division, eight, one and zero after nine games played. And uh, yeah, definitely, definitely the biggest surprise of the Pacific division, at least in the positive uh, column. I mean, we didn't have Henderson trending this high (laughs) in the, in our pre in our preview did not No, And it's funny. Because we did have Henderson and Ontario coupled up in that first preview episode. And uh, Ontario's the one that's <laughs> dwelling in the basement. And Henderson's the one that's, you know, excelling and doing so well. I think, you know, we, we pretty well had it flip-flopped and reversed a little bit. But anyway, I digress. Henderson and San Diego, that series is done recapped. And uh, next, last but not least, let's talk Colorado and Tucson. So... Yeah, the Eagles, uh, we both predicted that it would be a, uh, a split. We, well, we both predicted it'd be a split, and we both predicted that Tucson would take that that Friday game, and they sure did, and holy <laughs> holy cow, holy hell. Um, Colorado just completely botched that, and I, I have no problem. Um, I know that it's, it's you know something that I, I try not to game recap, I, I kind of fall into that because again, I write articles and I write game recaps, so it's easy to fall into. But I mean, to to chronicle the last two minutes of the third period and overtime, and to really see how the wheels fell off for Colorado in in being up three one with three minutes to play, with two and a half minutes to play in regulation, allowing two goals to be scored, and then falling in overtime because of a defensive lapse or rather to have a a player just completely rip through your defensive effort and just be caught on your heels. Uh, God, where do I start? Okay. Let's start with the first goal. So it's three, one Tucson is not in a position to pull their goaltender yet. So I I, no no six pack challenge, unfortunately for, (laughs) for, um, for coach Protvin down there in Tucson. But so you've got no penalties in the third at all, which I found was really odd. Because Tucson and Colorado both played very physical on Wednesday night when I saw them in person. So so no penalties in the third period. Um, did you feel like that was merited, though? Like, did you – I mean, there are going to be missed calls every game. It's just the inevitability of, you know, two guys trying to watch 12. But mm-hmm. did you feel like there was a lot of just letting them play? Or was this, you know – it was there was a rough game, but nothing that felt worthy of trips like a parade to the sin bin. Well, I mean, it just, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of, uh, I don't know. I, I want to say there wasn't a whole lot of penalties, but obviously when Yan Yenick and Liam O'Brien dropped the gloves in the first period, it's like, oh, you know, yeah, you kind of blow off some steam there in the first. And, 
you know, Sasha Mutala. I mean, we haven't heard his name pretty much at all, but he got a double minor for a high sticking at the end of the second. So I'm wondering, like, obviously Colorado is up three, one at this point. And, you know, I don't know. It's, it's tough to say because, you know, maybe Tucson was just so focused on their effort to score and, and trying not to, you know, draw those stupid penalties and Colorado wanted to protect their league, you know, two goal lead, the most precarious in hockey that maybe, you know, they just completely, <laughs> I don't know what the motivation was, but I don't think, I think it was probably somewhere in the middle because yeah, they sure had some shenanigans in the first and second periods there, <laughs> but and, I mean, they, they still played that physical game, but it wasn't like, okay, we're going to drop the gloves and we're going to fight, you know, three to one when Tucson was still in that game. Like Tucson still played smart and, you know, coming into those final two minutes, you know, it, it really, it culminated and it came to fruition because, you know, uh, yeah, Capo Bianco, you know, he, he, Capo, yeah, Capo Bianco, he, he drew Magna down and he, he, he drew him down. It was kind of like a reverse uh, TJ Oshi uh, power play thing. You know, when, when you're drawing the guy up the sideboards there, uh, Capo Bianco drew Jason Magna into the goal and then he passed it out to Schmaltz and Schmaltz was all alone between the left wing, the top of the left wing uh, face-off circle and the blue line. And he just slaps it home. And what Tucson did really well was generate all that traffic in front of Peyton Jones. That way Schmaltz could score that goal. And it was the same with the, the game tying goal with, you know, gosh, a handful of seconds left in the third. Um, I see. And I'm okay. 15 seconds left, 15 seconds left in the third. <laughs> and they let in another chance where, you know, Colorado had a couple of failed clearing attempts. Tucson, again, having that good traffic in front. Uh, and Capo Bianco from that left wing circle, it's like, you oh, know, they found Peyton Jones's Bane, maybe a little bit, or maybe it's just the traffic in front. I don't know. But from that left wing side, I mean, you, you got to see him play at P Penn State a little bit. So, I mean, is that left wing a, more of a weakness for Peyton Jones, or was it just the traffic in front, maybe? I would say probably more traffic in front. I, I okay. mean, off the top of my head, I, I wouldn't nothing like that stuck out where you know he's giving up more left side goals or you know shots from that side uh that i would really think would be significant i mean other than just kind of you know oh he let up 19 goals on that side versus 14 in the other over the course of how many you know games is random chance like i, I nothing sticks out into my mind like that though gotcha okay well i was just curious i mean i haven't oh, seen peyton jones fair. I've seen Peyton Jones play once in an Eagles uniform, so <laughs> I haven't 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 seen a, a big sample size from him. But anyway, you get to overtime, and basically Roy he draws, he comes out of the Eagle zone. It's three on three, of course. So he comes out of the Eagle zone. He looks like he's just kind of regrouping with his teammates, and then he just just goes right up the middle, and he catches all of them. As TJ Tynan especially catches all of them off guard and just. Tynan's on his heels. It was such a devastating loss for the Eagles. You know, it's just like, how do you blow a two goal lead with two minutes left and then lose in overtime? It's just like epic collapse. And so what do you think the response is? It's like, okay, well, the Eagles got to come out on Saturday and they got to do something. Who would have predicted a one zero win and Trent minor getting his first AHL shutout. It's like, okay, but Capo Bianco, I, he kind of fell apart in the second period a little bit. He had three penalties in the second period. So a guy that was like your bread and butter and really, you know, took the game by the horns and, and helped you win that first game on Friday. He just kind of, you know, he got an unsportsmanlike conduct for that third penalty. Maybe he was just getting pissed off, but you know, it's just, yeah, it was, it was a tale of two Tucson's, you know, you had that, you know, isolated Tucson on Wednesday. And it, it the, the same was for, for Saturday as well is that Colorado, you know, they, they kicked up their physicality and they didn't let Tucson get under their skin, but they kicked up their physicality to the point where, you know, it was a game changer and it shifted the momentum so that, you know, Tucson, you know, they couldn't create, they couldn't, you know, make plays in the neutral zone and, and push into the offensive zone with uh, any sort of game plan, you know, Colorado stifled that on Wednesday and it was the same for Saturday. I mean, yeah, that they just neutralized Tucson after, a devastating loss. And I think, again, that's another statement win for Colorado after, you know, after getting another statement win on Wednesday night. Um, I, I will say, I mean, it looks like Trent minor on Saturday really didn't have that hard of a workload through two periods. It, it really seemed like it was a Colorado, you know, 
Colorado tilting the ice in their favor. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it really, I I'd say even all three periods, you know, because whenever you hold a team to single digit shots um, for all three periods and, and you clamp down on them to the point where they can't convert on the power play. I mean, even Tucson didn't even have that many power plays. They had two power play chances, but the fact that eight shots, four shots, eight shots, and you know, you take a look at the shot map and you know, Tucson, yeah, they got, they've got a number of chance within the trapezoid there, but I mean, they were pushed to a fair, like probably eight to 10 shots, um, you know, outside of, of, outside of that trapezoid. So when half of your shots are coming from, from outside and, you know, I can't remember the traffic situations for those outside shots, but, but if Colorado was playing that physical game and pushing them so that, you know, Trent minor had the benefit of what Peyton Jones didn't on Friday night, then yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely something, it's a bit of a game changer where you can hold the team that you're facing to 22 shots on goal and yeah, just really make it a, a tale of two, two sons. Like I said, a uh, quick question for you here. Sure. Oh, for nine on the power play. Did it at mm-hmm. least look better? Mm. <laughs> I mean, not, not so much. I mean, it, I, I don't know. I, it, from, from what I saw like in person, from what I saw in person on Wednesday night, like they were generating a lot of chances and, and on Friday and Saturday from, from what I could see at home, you know, it was, it was more the same, but gosh, it's, it's hard to say. It's, it's hard to say why this power play isn't clicking, you know, cause you've got so many fringe AHL NHL guys that can contribute. And, and I mean, I mean, Prosvitov, he, he's just cool under the collar, I guess, during those power plays. That's the only thing that I could see. And the only thing that I could think of is because, you know, Colorado's not, you know, they're, they're not, not generating chances and they're, they're quality chances, you know, moving the puck across Royal road and everything like that. So I'm trying to find an answer, like a solid answer for you because it looks good, but the numbers just aren't coming. Like the, the goals just aren't going in. And I mean, sometimes you just snake bit like that. PDO mm-hmm. is a fickle mistress, but we must serve her. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. All right. Closing thoughts here on both teams. Uh, if I'm the coach of Colorado, what am I taking away here? What What are my big lessons that I learned this weekend? Uh, big lesson. I think Liam O'Brien in the lineup is a huge asset, both on the score sheet and not, because he sets the tone. He's a leader and he he plays, he, he, he expects you to play like he plays. And, and I think the guys followed suit, especially the younger guys, you know, and not just, not just on the, you know, not just on putting a body on somebody or, you know, getting dirty in the corners or anything like that, but on the four check on the back check, I mean, Liam O'Brien, like I said, he produced on the score sheet as well. So having him back, you know, I think really helped Colorado. I mean, Jason Megna, you know, he had a multi-point weekend. So having him back was huge as well. Um, Colorado, just keep that physicality up, you know, be continue to play with that grit because when they don't, you know, they, they just, it's a toss up. It's just kind of, Oh, you're, you're fast and you have your talent, but it's just 50, 50 toss up from what I've noticed now with Tucson, you know, it's like, let don't, don't get bullied, like continue that physicality, continue that compete and, and don't get bullied into playing the other team's game, which I think you know, they kind of fell into that a little bit with Colorado. It's like they couldn't generate any sort of offense. And so, you know, when you, when you're falling into the other person's game plan and you're trying to, you know, be too much, too physical and, and taking stupid penalties, a lot like Capo Bianco did in that Saturday game, it's like they, they, they got baited is what happened. It was a tale of two, you know, play more like you did on Friday night in, in, you know, in the last two minutes in an overtime where, you know, you were just, you were getting traffic in front. That's what Tucson needs to do more often is get that traffic in front. And Hey, if you can score those goals, then, you know, Hey, bomb it from bomb it from deep and get that traffic in front. And someone will get a stick on it or it'll, it'll go through and get in. So I think with Tucson, it's really advantageous for them to do that. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break here. And then when we come back, it's quiz time. All right. Don't go anywhere. Just hear a a quick ad and we'll be right back. All right. And we are back from our final ad break of the evening. And we're going to talk a little bit. uh, Well, well, we're going to have a quiz, but first we're going to introduce a new segment to the Calder Farmstead show. We're going to call it as the macho man, Randy Savage. So eloquently put it in a promo he did back in the eighties, the cream of the crop. Yeah. 
Oh yeah. All right. So <laughs> ridiculous how good you are. At that. I watched a lot of pro wrestling when I was younger and, you know, did a lot of voice impressions. So there you go. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about the cream of the crop. This is where we choose a number of players, two or three players during the week that we thought performed well. So Sean, take it away, my friend. Uh, my first cream of the crop here, like I said earlier in the show, he woke up Friday and chose violence. He woke up Saturday and he chose violence. violence. That's Garrett Pilon. Garrett Pilon, when you when you perform a highlight reel dunk that goes as close to viral as we can in the AHL on Twitter, uh, yeah, you get to be the cream of the crop of the week. CC, give me one of yours. Uh, well, I mean, I'm going to have to just – Go with what I know and, and stick with Jason Megna. I mean, he's only played three games with the Eagles, but hell, he had a goal in his first game back and in that uh, 3-1 victory over Tucson on Wednesday night. And he had two goals in the uh, the 4-3 heartbreaker uh, that the Eagles experienced on Friday night. So uh, the fact that he's coming right out of the gate and can contribute, you know, four shots on goal that first game, five shots on goal that second game, and three in that in that third game. And the fact is he hasn't accrued any penalty minutes either. So the fact that he can produce on the score sheet and not cause any bonehead plays liquid hot magna. All right. For me, uh, I, I checked our arbitrary rules that we set up uh, before the show about how many players I could put onto one pick for the cream of the crop. And I couldn't pick an entire line. So I'm just going to say Riley Barber. Uh, I wanted to pick Barber's whole line, but I, I, I couldn't. So I'm just going to stick with Riley Barber, who is absolutely a stud for uh, Grand Rapids this weekend. Without him, there's no way they achieve the upset of Chicago. Uh, Riley Barber, rifling shots past uh, the Wolves. Cream of the crop for the week, no question. And uh, uh, I'm going to stick in the, the Pacific Division for mine because – I was just super impressed. I mean, we haven't really covered San Jose and I kind of, you know, had a little dig at him earlier in the show, but the Barracuda and, you know, Joachim Blickfeld, um, really <laughs> just really impressing, just heads and shoulders above all of his teammates with six goals scored and, uh, and three assists and nine points in six games played, you know, just head and shoulders, like I said, above his teammates and everything. And gosh, I mean, when you, <laughs> when you have games, he, the only game that he hasn't been scoreless in was the, the season opener against Tucson. He's had multi-point games in four out of five of his games since he's played then. And so, yeah. And when you, when you have two goals, one goal and two goals in your last three games played, I mean, good golly. He's the cream of the crop. Yeah. And last for me here, I'm going to go a little bit off board. Uh, I'm going to say JF Barube to okay. uh, make the hockey PDO cast with Dmitry Filipovich very happy. JF Barube is my cream of the crop because you can't ask for more than what he gave the Ontario Reign this weekend. You know, coming in in relief, stopped 13 shots uh, in the second and third period of their game on the 27th, comes in the 28th, gets the start, stops 45 of 47 in a losing effort, unfortunately, but... You could not have asked more of JF Barube. He gave the rain a chance to, you know, try and sneak back into it on the 27th uh, and absolutely held the team together and gave them a chance to win on the 28th. That's all you can ask of your goaltender. And he absolutely did that in style. JF Barube, cream of the crop, brother. Oh, man, Ooh. I cannot do that as well. <laughs> <laughs> that was so bad. Oh, you, you went for it. You gave it the college try. I got to give you credit for that. <gasps> You started strong, but then <laughs> yep. you didn't main you didn't maintain the growl. Yeah, gotta maybe go see Miss Miss Elizabeth a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, all right. So that's our cream of the crop. Last but not least, finally, it's the quiz. It's quiz time. It's it's Tuesday. It is quiz time. All right. So for this week's quiz, we are going to take a page out of a podcast whose quizzes we've hijacked more than once, and that is Puck Soup. We are going to play <laughs> Schlem Code. Now, normally Schlem Code requires two people, but I'm adapting this to our own purposes. So uh, what this is, what's going to happen here is I'm going to give CC a year and a team, and he is going to have to name as many players as he can from that team's roster. Now, if he can get more than six 
CC will have won, will have earned his, you know, uh, his FaceTime and get to sign off the show. If he falls under six, he will not have won. And I will have won and get my FaceTime and my uh, sign off for the show. CC, the team that I am giving you, and I've, you know, done you a little bit of justice and a favor here. The 1819 Colorado Eagles. Can you name six or more players from that team who played at least one game? The 1819 Colorado Eagles. That was the that first is correct. One. I the am looking year, at the roster right now. The first year they were in the AHL, correct? That sounds correct. <laughs> I was going to say they're in their third season now. So nope, 18, that's the first year they were in the AHL. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I just. Clarifying that for my own sanity. Okay. Um, at least seven players. Okay. Let's uh, – now, if I get one wrong. Get one wrong, it's it. It's it's sudden death the whole way. Wow. Oh, crap. Okay. Um, so let's start with guys you definitely know. Logan O'Connor. Logan O'Connor is correct. You have one. Okay. Uh, Shane Bowers. Uh-oh. Oh no! Uh, this I think he sat this one out with concussion issues. Oh crap! Uh, nope. Oh, Shane Bowers played four games. You oh, got it. That's two. Oh goodness! Look yeah, at that. that. Oh wow! I thought he sat out that whole season, but may, yeah, he got four games in. Okay. Four games. Um, who is their goaltender? Um, hang on. Uh, Spencer Martin. Spencer Martin is correct. 23 yes. games played. Yes. I, I thought he was their netminder. Okay. We've got three. Um, okay. Um, Andrew Agazzino. Correct. Point leader with 60 points, 56 games played. Cody Bass. Ooh. What's that? Cody Bass. I believe so. Yes. Cody Bass, 35 games played. Oh, are you ready? For... You are teetering on the brink of victory here. Are, are you ready for this one? This is kind of a deep poll, but that's only because I was covering Idaho this year. Kale Kessie. Kale Kessie is correct. <laughs> CC, you got to six. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, you God. got there in fashion I was not expecting. <laughs> hey. Uh, um... Like some uh, memory joggers here before you uh, get a chance to rant. What's that? Would you like some memory joggers here of names you could have also said that would have been okay? That I was well, totally well hold on. I, I, I only got six. I thought you said I need to get seven. No, you needed to get six. Oh, oh, okay. I mean, if you want to keep going, I'm not going to stop you here. Flex. Oh, well, no, <laughs> I'm not going to. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll keep it there at six. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, that's fine. Come on, I, come on. Let's see some flex here, Cece. Give me at least okay. one more. Colin Campbell. <laughs> I think it was Colin Campbell. I could be wrong. Yep, I think I'm wrong. Colin Campbell. Let me start by player name here. That'll probably help. <laughs> I think that was the next season, to be honest. Colin Campbell. Good job uh, getting to 6 CC. <laughs> <laughs> Colin Campbell is not here. He's not there? Well, hang on. Let me look him up real quick. Colin Campbell, Colorado Eagles. Uh, so I think he played for the Eagles the next season. I think that's where I was confusing. He him. was, he played next season. Okay. Okay. That, that sounds good. So I <laughs> got to six and then fudged her up. Okay. Yep. <laughs> so what, what are some other ones that you were going to jog my memory with? AJ Greer, Logan oh, Honor, right. I, Lee, Martin mm, Kaut. Yeah. You, see, you put me on the spot and I already said LOC. I said Logan O'Connor. So oh, yeah, you said Logan O'Connor. Pavel I've, Francouz, I mean, 49 games played. Not a big oh, deal. Oh, Francouz, of course. Francouz, yep. Sheldon ah. Dries, 25 games played. Sheldon Silly Dries. Me. Yep. Mark Sheldon Holtz. Ah, yeah. See, I I just panicked. I had a brain fart, and I was doing deep pulls like Cody Bass and Kale Cassie. Or uh, Shane Bowers, rather, who only played four games that Four year. games, yeah. <laughs> you lucked out that one. All right, <laughs> CC. Okay. You did win. You got 30 seconds. What is on your mind? An untimed 30 seconds. So here we go. All right. So I am entering my fourth year as a credentialed journalist between the Idaho Steelheads and the Colorado Eagles. And if you would have told eight-year-old CC that, hey, you're going to be a sports journalist, but it's going to take you until age 30 to do it. 
uh, I would have said, I'm going to get there sooner than that. Well, life happens and stuff gets in the way. And so I just want to say to anybody that's considering becoming a sports journalist or starting a podcast or at whatever age, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, it's never too late. If, if you're passionate about it and you're knowledgeable about it, hell, even if you're not that knowledgeable about it, if you got the passion for it, start something, write a blog, start a podcast, get it going and learn on the way because you know, you only have this one life. And if you really want to do something, hell go for it. That's what I got. I like it. I, I've gone by the motto, you know, don't take it too seriously. Nobody makes it out alive anyway. <laughs> it's true. And, and like you said about the show, Sean, I mean, we don't take ourselves seriously, but what we, we take what we do seriously. Yep. Absolutely. There you go. All right. That's it for the show. If you guys are enjoying the show, please make sure you subscribe. So you get episodes in a timely fashion. Also, please rate and review the podcast wherever you're listening to it from, uh, or if you're watching on YouTube, uh, like the video and comment what you thought of the episode. Doing so helps others find the show, and your reviews help us improve it. You can also follow the show on social media, at Calder Farmstead on Twitter, at The Calder Farmstead on Instagram and Facebook. Links to all of that and more can be found on our link tree, which is scrolling below. Hey, uh, <laughs> And if you're listening to an audio version, the link is linktr.ee slash The Calder Farmstead. CC, take it away. Well, hey, my name is CC Hockley, like uh, we've addressed a few times this episode. And uh, Calder Farmstead is part of the Full Press Radio Network. You can find our program, other hockey podcasts, and many more sports programs, football, professional wrestling, baseball, basketball, all on Full Press Coverage at www.fullpresscoverage.com. Uh, you can find me representing Full Press Hockey on Twitter at FPC underscore AHL and on my personal Twitter account at CC Hawk. That's S E E S E E H A W K. I also throw in a pro wrestling tweet, music, memes, you know, general conversation and gifts, you know, uh, pretty much what anybody's standard Twitter account is these days, but mainly hockey. Mainly I talk about hockey. So speaking of which, you can check out my writing on the Full Press Coverage Network at www.fullpresshockey.com. If you do that backslash AHL, you'll find all of our AHL work there as well. Sean. I'm Sean O'Brien. You can find me on Twitter at Sean O'Brien 81. That's S-E-A-N-O-B-R-I-E-N 81. I'm also on Instagram, Sean O'Brien underscore 81. Uh, both of those are personal accounts like CC mentioned uh, with his, it's mostly hockey on Twitter with some, you know, pop culture and whatever else is going on that I want to kind of just shoot out into the void. Uh, my Instagram, I'm not as good a follow on Instagram. I mostly just don't know what to take pictures of. Uh, but you can <laughs> follow me on there. There is some, uh, you know, pictures of my pup or, uh, you know, the world going on around me. Uh, for the stats work that I do uh, that you probably hear about, you know, the PDO of all the teams, their point shares, uh, how good players are, that kind of thing. All of that can be found in my tableau at bit.ly slash data dump and chase, all lowercase, all one word. Big thanks to Adrian Drake, who made our theme music. You can find him on social media at AD underscore dysfunction, D-Y-S-F-U-N-C-T-I-O-N, so he can make music for you too. CC, take us home. All right, that's it for episode number 16. Thanks for tuning in as we recap the weekend that was, and we will keep her going. We will preview and recap as the season goes on. Previews will drop on Friday. Recaps will drop on Tuesday. So thanks for tuning in. And as always, keep your stick on the ice.